My name is Quincy Owens. I'm a successful Indianapolis-based visual artist, and every day I face the challenge of not only creating artwork that I'm personally proud of, but m that more often uh, resides in public spaces. Throughout my art career, time and time again, I have seen how art, art acts as an amazingly unifying force in both my life and the lives of others. It's not always that cute. <laughs> Tonight I'm gonna be talking to you about my artwork, how it's shaped me as a person, how it's connected me and others, and how it has been a, a means of play for me. I was born in 1977. I was also the cutest child in Indiana that year. <laughs> my dad was a barber. Somehow back then, my parents were able to buy 10 acres of property out in the country, build a beautiful home. I say that because it's not that easy anymore, but I grew up and thought that was normal. That 10 acres of woods was the first of many playgrounds in my life. When I wasn't playing in it, I was working. My family always worked, but it always felt more like play because we didn't do it if we weren't having fun. If you haven't heard it yet tonight, the most common definition for playground in the English language is a place that facilitates play. Another definition that resonates more personally with me is a place where a group of people choose to interact together. I won't delve into those definitions, but I, wanna, I want you thinking about them throughout the night. Back to me as a kid. I was so fortunate to have so many outlets for play and activity when I was young, but I think we too often forget how daunting that can be, especially for a child. I observed the skills and strengths of other kids, and it helped me decide what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to engage others. I knew I wanted to make friends and I knew I wanted to make art. In 1995, I graduated from high school. I had a few options. One of them was take the restaurant manager position that was being offered to me at the Burger King I worked at at the time. Sexy, I know. <laughs> Even sexier, I could have taken a job at a local factory like a lot of my friends had. There was a third option. I could be one of the first kids from my family to go to college. The competition was stiff but in the end, I decided on college. It sounded way more fun. I learned in college that it, my time on the playground as a kid was a proving ground. I wanna share a couple of things from college as highlights that really mean something to me. First, I met Dishad. He was the head of the art department and he was a ceramics instructor and if you can't tell, he has a pretty good sense of humor about himself. Over time, Dee became like a second father to me. He advocated for me. He gave me space and navigated with me while I explored young adulthood. In the end, he taught me how never to judge a book by its cover. Because of Dee at this time in my life, I thought I was gonna be a potter. Have you ever worked with clay? If you have, you know that it doesn't work on your schedule. So if nothing else ever teaches you patience, clay will. Clay that semester also taught me humility. I had signed up for Dee's wheel throwing class. There were literally two assignments the whole semester. One, center the clay. Two, make a cylinder. That was it. Easy, right? I went home for Thanksgiving with a zero in his class. <laughs> I had to come back after break and work hours and hours and hours at such a simple task of centering clay until I mastered it. I definitely wasn't ready to show my art world art to the public yet. I almost had nothing to show my professor even. Second, I met this guy, Christos Gutierrez. He was a visiting professor that came to teach drawing and contemporary painting. He was a big shot artist from New York City. He had made it. I was so intimidated by him. He had a fierce, and I mean a fierce presence, and I latched onto him. I decided to take his contemporary painting class, and again, I struggled, just like in Dee's class. I didn't know who I was at the time. I didn't know what I wanted to paint, but I knew that this guy had some things figured out and I wanted to learn from him. He had an amazing studio downtown, he had amazing artwork, and in my mind, he was the true definition of an artist to me, big, bold, and expressive. So I took his class and I learned a couple things. I experimented and I played around. He'd walk over, I was failing miserably. He'd walk away, not say anything. He'd walk back over later. I was still failing over and over again. I 
finally realized I wasn't learning the lesson I needed to learn in his class. I needed to find my artistic voice. And I finally did, late in the semester again, but I did. I took all of the money I had at the time, which wasn't a lot because I was a poor college student, went to the store, bought all the materials I needed to build two six foot by eight foot paintings. I showed up with those two paintings in the classroom. Christos just looked at me like, what is this guy doing? I took him in the studio. It was way too cramped. I was under way too much pressure. I needed to focus and I needed to be by myself. I packed up all my art materials, all my paints, all my canvases, and I walked right out of the doors of that studio with those canvases and I walked out into the courtyard at the school. I decided that I was gonna paint outside. I needed to focus and I needed to be by myself and I knew that these two paintings would determine if I passed or failed that class. And I got an A in that class. Christos taught me how to be a risk taker and he taught me to be relentless. This is that painting. I only bring it up now because I wanted to point out that I'm predominantly an abstract artist. I love abstraction for a million different reasons, but the main one is that I can't justify cre recreating something that already phys physically exists if I know I can create something that never has. Uh, beyond that, I feel like abstraction invites the viewer to come in with their own thoughts and perceptions and engage with the work. I was exhibiting art artwork what I would consider professionally, and I decided it was time for me to get a studio at the Harrison Center for the Arts. I needed a designated space where I could not only create my work, but show it to the public, and that changed my career forever. So then in 2006, I was working in my studio one day, and I got a knock on my door. It was the executive director of a new high school that was opening, Heron High School. They had invited me to become an art teacher there if I wanted to. Needless to say, I took the job. I don't want to talk too much about teaching, but I can tell you this. Surprisingly, I loved it more than I ever thought I would, but what I think relates to what I'm talking about tonight is how I devised my classroom structure and curriculum. I forced my students to constantly be designing new concepts, using new materials, and learning new techniques. I set it up so that I was accessible, supportive, and creative all the time, and my brain loved it. Moving along through teaching, I realized I'd learned a lot of other things from teaching. One of those things was that all of the kids that came into the classroom came in with their own ideas into the same space, and that that was okay. I realized then that I needed to learn how to lose my perspective in order to understand the perspective of other people. Now, still teaching in 2012, I was working with a student one day, and she said to me, oh, we're learning about this stuff in Mr. Crawley's physics class, too. Please don't assume for a second that I know anything about physics. But I did realize I better go down to Mr. Crawley's classroom and make sure that what I was teaching my students in my classroom was actually helping his curriculum, too. We hit it off right away. We hit it off right away because we liked teaching, but even more so, but because we had other creative, uh, creative outlets that we were passionate outside of school. I had discovered that he liked doing sound art pieces and that he was wanting to make those sound art pieces more sculptural. At the same time that he was wanting to do that, I had been making sculptures that I wanted to add sound to. So we collaborated and the Dunning-Kruger effect, composition number one, was born. The American Pianist Association had done a call out for artists to decorate a piano. I did not want to decorate a piano, so my submission idea was to painstakingly slowly disassemble a piano part by part piece by piece and reconstruct something new from that piano. What I realized as I was working on this sculpture is I couldn't make a sculpture out of a piano and it lose what the piano's essence is, its musicality. That's when Luke and I really began to collaborate. After the Dunning-Kruger effect composition number one, in 2013 I emailed my boss while teaching and I said we need to meet. Basically I sat down and I told her, I know I'm lucky that I have not one, not two, but three passions, and one of them has got to go. God had told me I was meant to be an artist. That's the day I quit teaching, and then my art career truly took off. I started focusing on this new career trajectory. I focused on my work. I started to trust others. I started to have faith in myself. I still collaborated with Luke. I saw a call out for a sculpture project that included both science and art principles. And I was like, oh, Luke, this has got our name all over it. And he just looks at me like I'm crazy. In the end, we came up with a design, submitted it. We actually won. We pinched ourselves. 
and then the kabikoscopes were born. The kabikoscopes were important for all sorts of different reasons to us. First, there were the logistics of how to create these things in general. We had to coordinate engineers, uh, fabricators, we had to design curriculum to, accom to accompany the sculptures, we were organizing workshops with area schools where we were going to give art and physics lessons. It was hard. In the end, we just had to do all of this stuff to figure out how to make these actual sculptures. After the kabikoscopes, we had enjoyed collaborating together. Luke and I looked at each other, we're like, we could keep doing this. But we have to be honest with each other. We have to make artwork that we think is sincere to what we believe, but also reaches a broader audience. So in 2013, we decided we'd enter Art Prize with colonization of commonality. Essentially, conceptually, this installation is about the difference between humans and bees. Bees know what they do for their colony. They don't ask questions. They just know what their role is in their society, and they do it for the sake of the greater good. Humans, capable of doing the same thing, are stuck with free will and emotions. Even with higher intellectual capacities, a lot of us still struggle with how to find purpose in our life. To that end, we had decided that we would set up recording stations, and we would interview people and ask them for their own definitions of core human emotions, such as love, hate, um, hope, uh, sadness, you get the idea. Not a single person, out of all of the people that we interviewed, not a single person gave the exact same definition of a core human emotion that all of us as humans share on a daily basis. In the end, we'd made an installation of 31 sculptures that were laid out in a hexagonal pattern insp uh, inspired by bee colonies. The speakers were emitting the sounds of all of those human emotions, and what we never saw coming when we finally installed it and turned everything on is as you heard those core human emotions, you were walking into the sculptures, it became cacophonous, and it sounded just like the busy, bustling beehive that we were also relating to. Now, Luke really had the itch. We decided we'd do Art Prize again in 2014 with prime commonality. The main concept behind prime commonality was to relate how closely we are related to primates. If we are so, gen sorry. So what we did visually for these pieces is we overlapped chimpanzee and human DNA. Uh, that was meant to relate how close we actually are to primates. And if we're that close in relationship to primates biologically, can you imagine how closely re related all of us in this room are? And yet, how many of us do we push away from each other constantly instead of make the choice to unite as one? 2016, Willie the Whale. In the crazy world that I've created for myself somehow, I get the opportunity to do things with iconic whales like this. At the time, there was a call out at the Indianapolis Museum of Art for artistic mini golf hole ideas. I submitted Willie. Why not? I didn't think it'd get accepted. In the end, I got contacted by the director, Scott Stuhl, and he's like, Willie's not only in the mini golf course, he's the 18th hole. There are a lot of things I liked about this project. Number one, again, were all of the new logistics that I had to learn how to do. I had to organize trucks and cranes and traffic permits and avoid some traffic permits, get it to the museum, get it up, on the roof and still make it a playable mini golf hole that people would enjoy. I was really excited to be able to make a piece of art that was inter interactive. It was meant to be played by individual individuals or whole groups. In the end, so many components came together. I knew that I was taking a risk, trying to pull this off, and it could ruin my art reputation, but it was worth it to see if I could. Number two were all of the logistical challenges that I talked about already and also that I was able to make this fully playable, fun for all, mini golf hole, and third, probably most important, I impressed my mother-in-law. <laughs> now, moving forward. After Willie, we were busy with all sorts of other projects that were informing us in ways we didn't know what they were informing us for. One of those projects was 2058, the first September without ice. 
What all of these projects were gearing us up for was that Luke and I had been commissioned to make a 30-foot tall sculpture. Sale is special. The city of Carmel had reached out to us and commissioned us to make something that was monumental. That was their words. We pulled it off with our design, but we'll never tell the people in the city of Carmel and people don't think about anyway are all of the major new logistical nightmares that a couple of high school teachers had to figure out. First, we had to design what they were looking for. Then we had to make it. Then we had to make three of them because that was my idea. Why would we just make one sculpture? Let's make three that connect at the top. We had to figure out how to get them out of our studio door because they wouldn't fit. We had to get them on trucks. We had to get them up there. We had to get them safely erected and installed. Everything, and I mean everything, about this project was hard. The project itself and then everything outside of it in our lives made this so challenging, but we knew we had to persevere. And I said sale is special. Sale is special for another reason. We were really excited to be able to make a sculpture that had a large footprint that you experienced from a distance in an iconic way, but then was also designed so that as you got closer, the experience of the sculpture changed. And what we were able to do is make this large iconic sculpture that as you walk up close to it, you realize there's basically a sanctuary space on the inside that's designed for you so that you can take yourself away from the public and go into the, this sculpture and have your own private space with it, whether that's by yourself, with a friend, or loved ones. Now, this is me today. I still make big, bold, expressive paintings. I still make liturgical art things and installation-based works. We make sculptures where we are intentional about giving a place for contemplative space. The uh, sculpture on the left is a, a sculpture that's at a elementary school in Washington, D.C. Sometimes we get invited to make walls. Politically, we really struggle with that. So what we do is we design walls that don't separate neighborhoods, but invite them to come together. Why well, I think I'm here today is because art doesn't exist in an echo chamber. I've created daunting tasks and done challenging commissions, and they've made me such a better person. I also know that when I learned how to step out of my perspective, again, it helped me be able to step into other people's perspectives. And more so, that art isn't just personal, it can be communal. And by the way, I've literally made a playground. Thank you. <laughs>